welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade, and today I am joined by Lieutenant Colonel Fritz Gloyek. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Happy to be here and uh, humbled you guys would ask me to be here. Absolutely. Now, sir, you'd prefer to go by plugger, right? So that works. We'll use that one. I imagine that there's a very interesting story behind that nickname, but for the sake of brevity and the fact that we don't have any uh, libations here with us, uh, we will forego that for another time and just use your go by plugger for the rest of the episode, if that's all right. Sounds like a plan. All right. So by way of introduction for the audience here, this is the beginning of a series that we're doing on this podcast readdressing, revisiting the topics of what it is that the Air Force values in an Air Force officer, but from the commander perspective. And I want to thank you, sir, for joining us in kicking off this series. You are a squadron commander. That is correct, right? Yes. Yeah. So on that topic, let's just give you the opportunity to introduce yourself, let the audience know a little bit about what your experience has been in the Air Force, how you got to this point where you are sitting in a commander's billet and lay the stage for the commentary that will come later about executing the mission and what it means to be in that role as a commander. Cool. Thanks, Colin. Again, thank you for having me here. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Plugger Gloyak. Uh, I am a 2006 graduate of the Air Force Academy. Okay. It's the class of SPOTS. After that, I went to pilot training at Laughlin Air Force Base, got to stay there for an extra three years and be a first assignment instructor pilot in the T-6. After that, went to the A-10, and I've had five ops assignments uh, flying the A-10 over the last uh, 10, 12 years. Okay. was lucky enough to go do the Blue Horizons. It's a little known fellowship down at Maxwell where you get to try to do some small things to make strategic impact. And then... I was lucky enough to be invited back to Davis Monthan to be a DO and now the uh, 354th Fighter Squadron Commander. So no better place to be than leading the Bulldogs. Okay, so you've made the rounds a little bit with operations and flying the A-10. I'm assuming there's been a couple of deployments in there as well? Uh, Some time in Afghanistan and then uh, quite a bit of time over in Korea. So I've spent over three and a half years out in Korea. So kind of flown a lot of the Pacific from uh, South China Sea up to Alaska. Okay, so needless to say, you have seen some operations. You've been involved in executing the mission quite a bit over the course of your career. Been fortunate. All right. Well, that's good because we're going to rely heavily on that experience on the back end of the rebroadcast, which we're going to cut to here in just a moment. And looking forward to hearing your take on what it means to be a commander and your responsibility in executing the mission on behalf of the Air Force. For sure. All right. So let's cut there to the episode on executing the mission. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I am Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. We did an episode about the new line of the Air Force developmental categories. And in that episode, we talked a little bit about a memo that was sent out by General Goldfein to all of his wing commanders. And in that memo, General Goldfein outlined four things that the Air Force or we as the officer corps in the Air Force value in our officers. And today we are going to initiate a series of episodes in which we take a much closer look at those different values, the things that we value in our officers. The four values are we value how an officer accomplishes or executes the mission. We value how that officer leads their people, how they lead airmen. We value how that officer manages their resources. And we value how that officer works to improve his or her unit. But today, we're going to focus on the first of those, which is executing the mission. We often use one of those really cliche phrases that you hear so frequently. We often say, mission first. 
So I think it's important that we start there, Reed, with what is meant by mission and also what is meant by first so that we can better understand mission first. Yeah, thanks, Colin. So the mission is what we're doing this all for. You know, this is the proverbial office space. What is it you say you do around here? You know, what are we doing this all for? What is the whole point and purpose? And for the United States Air Force, the mission is defined in Air Force instruction. One, TAC-1. It is the first instruction that we have. And it is the only thing up front of the mission on this document is an overview paragraph. So this mission statement is key. It drives everything we do. And the mission is to fly, fight, and win in air, space, and cyberspace. Wait a minute, Reed. Are you telling me that that goofy phrase that we make every single cadet and officer and enlisted airman memorize is actually in an Air Force instruction? Not only is it in the Air Force instruction, it is the underlying premise of everything that follows it. So yes, it is absolutely in an Air Force instruction and it is the baseline for everything we do. That is fascinating. I thought it was just another one of those cliche phrases that, yay, go Air Force. Yeah, we print it on mugs and sell them. And, and yeah, no, that's... So yes, we do print it on mugs and t-shirts and hats, but it is truly fundamental. Every single paragraph in the rest of that document relates immediately back to the mission. The next one in that document is core values. And it shows how those core values help us accomplish the mission. It talks about the oath, how that helps us accomplish the mission. And it goes on from there. Everything we do must be tied back to this mission of fly, fight, win in airspace and cyberspace. Yeah, that's really important. Thanks for pointing that out. And also what we do in the Air Force, that flying, that fighting, that winning in airspace and cyberspace must always also be tied back to the even bigger picture than just what we do in the Air Force. And that bigger picture is known as the National Defense Strategy or NDS. Yeah, the last one came out in 2018 and encourage anyone who's not familiar with it, go ahead and Google that and pull it up. It'll be an insightful read. It provides the background for everything that your Department of Defense is focused on and thinking about. It directs all the manpower, it directs all the money, all the effort, all the force that is projected downrange towards our enemies and anything that we do in the Air Force, whatever that quote mission is, must always tie back to flying, fighting, and winning in airspace and cyberspace, as well as the support and accomplishment of the national defense strategy. This will look different to every airman every day. Even some of us that are doing the same job, it will change over time, the way we are accomplishing the mission, the way it fits into the bigger picture. But the key is, is that all of those efforts collectively accomplish the overall objective. And as an officer, it's one of your primary responsibilities to not only ensure that what you're doing ties to that overall objective, but that also you can help communicate that to your folks. Sometimes when your head is down and you're in the weeds, you're not really sure how this ties to the mission. And that's one thing that a good officer can do is they can tie it back to why this matters. And it can really help your folks out when, like I said, sometimes they're put in the hours and they're not really sure how this makes sense. Along with that, something to know is that if you are doing something that doesn't make sense, your people are going to see right through it and they're going to call BS on what you're doing. Now, sometimes you have to help explain to them what it is and why it matters that they're doing it. But if you can't do that, you can't do that well, maybe that's something you need to stop. Absolutely. Yeah. Up and down the chain, everybody has to understand what it is that they're doing and why they're doing it. If they can't, then it makes it very difficult to accomplish a mission because obviously you and they don't know what the mission truly is. So Colin, we've talked about what the mission is and a little bit about why it's important, but what does it mean that it's first? Well, you kind of hit on it already in that in 1-1, it is first. It's the first thing that is outlined in our Air Force instructions, in our doctrine. It's the first thing that we attend to. It's the first thing that we focus our, our attention and our efforts on. But in a day-to-day -day context, we have to understand what that truly requires. That it's not just a trite phrase. It's not just, oh yeah, I woke up today and I went and accomplished the mission. Sometimes it requires far more than just showing up to work. Sometimes it requires 
extreme sacrifice. This may mean time away from family. We talked a little bit about that in the short episode about being away from family for Thanksgiving or for other holidays. Sometimes it requires late nights or shift work. I have been called in on the weekends more times than I care to count. I have spent more time in my job than I care to admit. And that's time away from my family. That's time away from things that I enjoy, things that I want to do or accomplish, all because I believe in and have obligated myself to accomplish the mission for the Air Force. Yeah, that's great. Just to go back to Air Force Instruction 1, TAC 1, paragraph 1.5 talks about a way of life. And it kind of sums up really well everything that you have mentioned. Just want to read a couple things here. The mission must be accomplished, even at great risk and personal sacrifice. Airmen are always subject to duty, including weekends, holidays, while on leave. If ordered, you must report for duty at any hour, at any location, and remain as long as necessary to get the job done. And it goes on from there. And I think you really captured that really well. Sometimes getting the mission done means personal risk, whether that's physical, emotional, mental, social. You can be put in danger in any and all of those ways. I know myself, I have done, seen, learned, experienced things that I wish I hadn't. Not many, but there have been some. But that's the cost of doing what we do. And we know that at the time we sign up. And I think it's important to highlight that this is a way of life. This isn't just a job. I know we've talked about this in our previous episodes, but it's so important to highlight again here in the context of accomplishing and executing the mission that Taking care of the mission, accomplishing the mission is a way of life. It's not just a nine to five. You show up and you leave when the clock strikes five. No, you leave when the mission is done or when you have done as much as necessary to enable the continuation of the mission. Obviously, there will be times where you have to you know, take a step back away from the mission you know, because you can't work 24-7. 365. Obviously, you know, we understand that. But if the mission requires it, you must sacrifice your time, your talents, your, your very life if that is what is required. Yeah. Sometimes the mission is taking care of people, right? We've all been required to show up for what we call mandatory fun events that the purpose and intent of that event is to take a break purpose of that event is to connect with your peers in a more social environment, to have a more relaxing afternoon, you name it. But you've got to get the mission done. And even that morale event or whatever is with the purpose of further enabling you to at a time and place required in the future is to get the mission done. There has to be a balance. You simply can't throw your people into the buzzsaw that is operations and expect that there will always be another person to throw the problem. That is the challenge of leadership. And if you are leading your people well, I can promise you they will get in line, thump their chest and run into the buzzsaw, screaming with their best war cry. And I've seen it. I've been part of those units. I've also been the other way and in units that drag me kicking and screaming simply because they weren't leading well. Both sometimes are required. It all depends on the situation. But yes, all those things help us understand and realize this idea of mission first. So just to summarize, Reed, the mission is to fly, fight, and win in airspace and cyberspace. That is what we do in the Air Force. And we do that first. We do that before anything else. We take care of the mission before we do anything else. So now the question is, Reed, why? Why do we put the mission first? Why is it so important? Without trying to sound facetious or reductive, the bottom line is, is we cannot afford to fail. The cost is simply too high. Your personal feelings, your emotional state, your relationship with other people, whatever category of thing that you think is of extreme value to you, all pale in comparison to the cost of mission failure. Colin, if we fail, People die, nations will fall apart, and everything we hold dear is at risk. Yes, people do this mission and we must take care of them. 
But we also need to be willing to accept that in doing so, it may require the blood of those who fight for these freedoms. And that's the bottom line. Now, Reed, I have to admit that does sound a little hyperbolic. I mean, if I, as an officer, as a brand new second lieutenant, newly assigned to my first base, my squadron, if I fail at my mission, is the United States really going to you know, come apart at the seams? It isn't right then. But every decision you make, every action we take, it all is part of a much bigger whole. And if you fail at your mission today and we accept that failure, what is going to be the reaction from that? Will the airmen around you lower their standard? Will they perform not enough because failure is acceptable? Will that create a culture and a belief that it doesn't matter? That's what we're fighting day to day when, yes, Colin, as you described, perhaps if I don't get this document accomplished before zero, you know, zero seven hundred tomorrow morning, the world will not fall apart. But what will that decision that I make to accept less mean for me? What will that decision to accept less mean for the airmen I lead? What will that culture that I create, what will that belief system be? Because there may be a time where you literally have your finger on the trigger and everything that you've done to get you to that point will have created the environment necessary for you to make critical, important, and lasting decisions. And I've also been a little bit in that situation, not that the world was going to come to an end, but I've been there to accomplish the mission of bringing the fight to the enemy. And it is not the time when the lives are at risk to decide who you are and what you're made of and how much work you're going to put in to do it right. It's too late at that point. So I think you bring up a good point, Colin. Every single awards package is not going to make or break the difference for the United States. But when that time does come, and I will tell you it will come, it's too late to start preparing at that time. Thanks for explaining that, Reed. That helps a lot. So, Colin, this is where the scientist and son of an engineer in me is really, really wanting a whiteboard where I could, you know, pop this up for our audience. But I have a chart that I'd like to describe that I think can help explain this concept a little bit of putting mission first and what sacrifices that kind of requires. I have an idea, Reed. How about you draw this chart out? You can do it on a piece of paper or even better, you can make a video of it and we will share it in our Facebook group. So if people really want to see it, they can come check it out there. All right. So I want you to imagine a square that is further divided into four even squares. You've got one vertical line going through the center and one horizontal line going through the center. And on the X and Y axis of the outside of the square, right? So the leftmost line is value of relationship. And on the bottom of this big square, you have the value of a specific outcome, all right? So as you get farther away from the bottom left-hand corner of this big square, the value of the relationship and the value of the outcome gets more important to you. Right. So this creates four categories where we'll describe kind of the situations in each. So let's imagine that there's a something of high relationship value, meaning you value the relationship a great deal, but the value of the specific outcome is lower. An example of this is yes, dear, yes, dear, those jeans look fine on you. Or another one, I don't care where we go to dinner tonight. Now, do you actually have opinions about those things? Sure. But what matters more than the outcome of some specific thing is the relationship with the person that you're involved with. Let's go to the opposite side of that. So low value relationship, high outcome value. This is something like trying to teach a child how to ride a bike. Yes, of course, you have a relationship with this person and you value that. But at the moment you're teaching them to ride a bike, you value the outcome of learning to ride more than how they feel about you at that moment. When you let go of that bike seat, especially the first few times, almost overwhelmingly, that child's going to fall and it's not going to feel good. But if you don't let go, they're not going to learn how to ride a bike. And so at that moment, you're valuing the outcome higher than the objective. I don't know if that's the best example. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I understand what you're trying to say is that, yeah, the specific quality of the relationship at that point in time is less important 
than the overall outcome. Yes. Yeah. And, and this isn't to say that you don't value the relationship. It's just like you said, Colin, at that specific moment, you may take steps that this person may hate you. This is, you know, maybe another example is as a teenager, you think your parents hate your guts and they're taking steps to ruin your life. And they will willingly accept that criticism because they value your safety and security more than what they think about you at that moment. Just some examples. All right. So the next one is where you have a high relationship value and a high outcome value. And Colin, this is where the hard work is. This is where we are overwhelmingly. This is where you have to put in effort to establish, maintain relationships. You have to listen actively. You have to make sure others can understand how important this outcome is to you and you recognize how important it is to them. And I'll tell you, this is where the magic can really happen. And this is where we need to be operating most of the time. An example of this is when, as a leader, you have a deep, profound care for someone, but they're failing to achieve the objective. You have to come up with a way to counsel this person, to get them in line, to get them back on the same page without distancing them in a relationship. And this is tough. Do you have any good examples of anything in this category? Yeah, I like what you were hitting on earlier about this being the place where you have an underperforming airman or officer that you're responsible for, or even a civilian. And, you know, as a supervisor, need to exercise some really effective leadership. You need to work with them on an intimate level, on a a really personal level, you know, demonstrating that higher relationship value in order to help them achieve a higher level of performance. Otherwise, what may happen is they get removed from their position. They may get forcibly separated from the Air Force. And that's certainly not where we want people to be. But remember, the mission must come first. And if an individual is a drag on the system, if they are making it difficult to accomplish the mission, then we need to help them get out of the way. Yeah, exactly. All right, the last container we haven't talked about is almost one where we don't need to, but we need to just for completeness describe when you have a low outcome value and a low relationship value. So I'm trying to come up with an example. Imagine you're standing in line at the grocery store. You hear someone, maybe two or three people back, complaining about the number of clouds in the sky. And you're, all the audience is probably thinking to themselves, why on earth are we talking about this? Exactly. We don't care. We don't care about our relationship with this person, three people back in the grocery store line. We don't care about the number of clouds in the sky. We're just going to move on. And that is just a category of things that you are not going to care about. So why did I give this example? I think it's really instructive to look at when you have to make a choice between relationship or outcome. The Air Force requires and our service requires and expects and demands that when we have to make a choice between relationship or outcome, we will always choose outcome. The cost of failure is too high. And ideally, we don't have to make a choice between relationship and outcome. Ideally, we can be in that upper right-hand quadrant where we're always working with relationships to get things done. But at the end of the day, if you have to, you're going to pick outcome over relationship. Yeah, that's very helpful, Reed. It gives us a way to consider how we might deal with prioritizing our time, our effort, our relationships, the things that we are involved in. It gives us a framework to work from. So I think that's valuable. So with that understanding, with that framework in place, help us better understand why does the Air Force value specifically how an officer accomplishes and contributes to their assigned mission? Sure. I think this will be relatively intuitive to anyone in our audience who's ever been in a group or on a team or in any way had a group project. Bottom line, if everyone in that organization isn't pulling their weight, the whole team can feel it. The whole group can feel it. And I think everyone has been in that situation to some degree. Sometimes they are that person and they've been a drag on the organization. But bottom line, we value how they accomplish the mission and how much they contribute because we need every single person. 
We are highly specialized in the Air Force. Everyone has a very specific role and we need everyone to be doing it every day. This can be, you know, in a direct way, you can have a direct, meaningful contribution to the mission or it can be more tangential. But the bottom line is, if it's you leading your team or you providing that direct contribution, one of our core values is excellence in all we do. And you will find people who are crushing the mission every day and are making themselves invaluable. And we need to find ways of recognizing and rewarding those folks. One thing that I want to emphasize here, Reed, is that one, we value that the officer is first accomplishing the mission, period. But then after that, once we know that the mission is being accomplished, we value how the officer is accomplishing the mission. And that kind of goes back to your relationship and outcome chart that you were discussing before, is that, as you were saying, the Air Force is always going to choose outcome over relationship. But if we have an officer that is able to do, as you were saying earlier, about maintaining that high relationship value and the high outcome value operating in that top right quadrant, then that is truly where we want our officers to be. That's where you want to be. You want to not just accomplish your mission, but you want to do it in such a way that is not going to burn out your people, that is going to leave them with a bad taste in their mouth, that is going to push them in a direction that is unhealthy for them, for you, or for the Air Force. So it's not just accomplishing the mission, though, yes, we want to accomplish the mission full stop. We want to accomplish the mission in such a way that will allow us to continue to accomplish the mission in the future. Not just one time, but every time. Yeah, that's a good point. I've been in situations where there were three or four officers contributing to mission accomplishment. And there was a way that some of them can be in that upper right quadrant, getting value out of their people, maintaining relationships, getting the mission done. And someone was being just as effective at accomplishing the mission, yet we're not valuing their people in any way. And so I think that's a really good point to bring out that we want to value and encourage and reward those who are in that upper right. You know, that's definitely, you know, the graduate level leadership. That's definitely the, you know, the big leagues. Yeah. And that all plays back into what we've discussed previously about this is how an officer gets promoted, because this is one of the things that we value. If you want to, get promoted, the Air Force needs you to accomplish the mission. But if you want to get promoted, accomplish the mission. But if you want to stick around long enough to where you are in a position and have the reputation and the social capital to make some real significant changes and truly help the Air Force further its goals, then you need to be operating at that higher level. John Boyd, one of the myths and legends of our Air Force, had this, put it this way. He said, you can either be somebody or you can do something. If you want rank position, that's being somebody. But if you really want to have an impact, you got to do something. That's what you're talking about, Colin, right? We got to be in that place where we can actually make an impact on the mission. Yeah. So let's actually share some stories here from our experience about mission failure or mission accomplishment. I've got a good one that I want to share from my time as an instructor at Air Force ROTC field training. The situation was that I was running in the obstacle course. And in this obstacle course, the mission assigned to the cadets is to carry this Intel container through the obstacle course. And while they're going through the obstacles, they have to gather additional Intel and reach the end of the course, unscramble the message and deliver the Intel container to its final location, right? The most common outcome for this particular obstacle course is that cadets would get to the end usually wouldn't finish it. So they would run out of time because they weren't working together. They weren't staying focused on using their strengths and making sure people were contributing fully to the mission. But even if they got to the end, usually what would end up happening is they would run out of time there and without unscrambling the message and delivering the Intel container to where it's supposed to go. But usually what would happen is when the time would run out, they'd be super excited that they got to the end of the obstacle course and they would congratulate each other on getting to that point. Yeah, they would say, okay, we didn't finish the mission. We didn't 
get the Intel to where it was supposed to go, but we got to the end of the obstacle course and we had a great time doing it. We worked together, yada, yada, yada. And that had happened. I'd seen that conversation play out multiple, multiple, multiple times. And I got to a point where I was just like, I've had it. I can't listen to this anymore. Now, granted, I probably came a little down, a little too hard on these cadets, but I needed them to learn this lesson. And I want to share it with all of the cadets who are listening to this podcast. It is not okay for you to fail your mission. If you fail, accept your failure. Do not get to the end of the obstacle course or whatever the scenario, group leadership projects, LRC, doesn't matter what it is. If you get to the end and you failed, do not say it's okay that we failed because it's not okay. It is not okay for you to fail. You need to accept the responsibility for that failure, recognize why it was that you failed and make plans, take steps so that in the future you don't fail. Like the Air Force mission that we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast, when we say at the end of the Airman's Creed, that we will not falter and we will not fail, we need to mean it. We need to be true to that that statement and that sentiment. We will not fail because the cost is too high. And if we accept failure, as you were describing earlier, Reed, we start to build a pattern and a habit of mission failure, of accepting that something other than mission accomplishment is okay. Now, I know that is a little bit of a downer, And that's not where we want to end. So Reed, pick us back up again. Show us what mission success looks like and why it's a good thing for the Air Force. Sure thing. This is a story from my time at the Combined Air Operations Center, the CAOC at Al Udeed in Qatar back in 2014. So one of my primary responsibilities while I was there was to ensure that the correct theater airborne intelligence surveillance reconnaissance assets were assigned to the appropriate missions. So imagine you're working on a car, you've got a lot of tools in the toolbox. My job was to make sure that the right tool was in the hand of the mechanic at the time it was needed. We had a group of Marines that were going to be flying into Iraq in the CV-22. So the funky vertical takeoff looks like a helicopter thing and then the engines rotate forward and then these two massive props turn into, you know, a forward flying aircraft. It's really fun to look at, impressed with the engineering every time I see them. Anyway, they were coming in to do some work in country in Iraq and they had requested and been granted some overhead, some protection. Basically, they were going to use an Intel asset to make sure that they were safe. They were not going to be in danger of anything. And that's one of our primary responsibilities, not only to find the enemy, but to protect the people that are out there doing the fighting. And this activity, right, the allocation of theater aircraft is both an art and a science. And a general officer all well-meaning, I'm certain, had requested and been given a very specific asset. The problem was, to those of us in the group who this is what we do every day, we knew that this was not the right asset for a variety of reasons. It wasn't the right tool for the job. And I saw an officer, you know, immediately make that connection and figure out what asset was correct and then go to that person's leadership. And at risk, basically had to tell a general officer they were wrong and they had to change their plan, laid out a few reasons why this person's leadership saw the vision, understood why this decision was wrong and why they had to make the change. And that person had to go to the, literally had to go into the general's office. We're talking three and four star generals and say, oh, you know, that plan you two worked on yesterday, we're going to change it. And this is why, you know, it took a lot of personal risk. It's uh For those who haven't interacted with general officers much, it's a hard thing to tell them they're wrong. And to see that happen was quite impressive. So good for these generals. They recognized the change needed to be made. They made the change. The next day, the Marines went in. And as they were going in, this asset was in place and was able to provide intelligence to the aircraft that they were in immediate and imminent danger. They took evasive action. And we are certain that those Marines and those aircraft are able to fly, fight, and win another day as a result of that asset being in place. So that was a real example to me of how a single person can have a huge impact on the lives 
of the people that we fight with and on the success of the mission. Had we lost those Marine aircraft and those Marines over Iraq that day, it had the potential to completely change the outcome of what we were trying to do. And instead, at personal risk, this officer was able to get the right tool at the right place at the right time to keep those folks safe. So hopefully that'll pick up the tenor and tone of our conversation. Absolutely. Thank you, Reed. I appreciate that. You bet. And to wrap things up here, whether it's you as an individual, as Reed has described at personal risk, being the one to ensure the accomplishment of the mission, or whether it's you leading a team, or whether it's you uh, providing the direction and the resources and the training to a team, or being given direction from above and being part of that team, the focus must remain on accomplishing the mission. That's what we're discussing here. And that is the first value described by General Goldfein and outlined in AFI 1-2 of what it is that we value in our Air Force officers. So if you want to be a part of this profession, if you want to pursue this lifestyle, this way of serving others and serving our country, you must maintain that focus on mission accomplishment. In Secretary Mattis's latest book, Call Sign Chaos, he describes the importance of this when he had imbued this vision of first do no harm when he was leading troops in Iraq. It was a complicated situation, complicated setting. You know, you have civilians integrated with the enemy and it was a really tense situation. And he recalls not only in this book, but in an interview with NPR in September of this year, watching his Marines put themselves at great personal risk to accomplish the mission, yet keep this vision alive of first do no harm. And what a humbling and amazing experience that was for him. And it left an impression on him that'll last forever. And that's the impact that we can have when we're accomplishing the mission that we've been tasked to give and maintaining the high ground and the credibility of the force that we're projecting. That is how our nation will win. Sounds awesome. Definitely something I want to be a part of. And thank you, Reed, for providing your expertise and your knowledge on the matter. And we hope that it has been useful to our audience, especially those that are already commissioned or looking to gain a commission as an Air Force officer. If this podcast has been useful to you, we encourage you to share it, as well as to leave us a rating or review. Engage with us on the social media platforms. Make sure that you go join us on the Facebook group so that you can see Reed's whiteboard lecture and you know, learn at the feet of the master there. Also, if you have any questions, you can send those to Air Force Officer Podcast at gmail.com or direct message us through any of the social media platforms that we're on. Anything else that you want to say, Reed? Mission first. And hopefully soon we'll talk about people always. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Commission Ed. All right, sir. So now the audience has had a chance to listen to the discussion that Reed and I had about executing the mission, how it's outlined in AFI 1-TAC-2, Commander's Responsibilities. Obviously, when we did the episode, we were talking about officership in general. But now it's really important that we look at it from the commander's perspective. And so I want to give you the opportunity to share your thoughts here, what it means to be a commander, what is the commander's responsibility toward the mission, how do you go about carrying out operations, just help us as an audience understand how you are seeing things from your seat. So from the commander's perspective, I think it's important to understand first the difference between like duty and responsibility. Okay. So... You know, we all take the oath that will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office upon which we're about to enter. But really, when I think of a duty, it's basically an assigned task, right? Or a series of assigned tasks. But when I think about responsibility, I think of all the tasks that you are accountable for or answerable for, but you don't necessarily even perform them yourself. Right. So if you're, you know, a cadet or a young CGO, young company grade officer, your duties are probably starting off pretty small, pretty clearly defined. You're told what time to show up. You're told what to wear, all of those type of things. And then because those are pretty clearly defined, you can usually like work harder to get through them, right? right? So you can stay later. You can come in on the weekend. You can fix some problems. I think of it as for me, if I was struggling in pilot training, 
it means you need to like prepare more, study harder, chair fly more, you know, and be ready to go. For other people, maybe you're behind on paperwork and you can just stay later to catch up. You can triple check it before you turn it in this time. You can work harder and work longer hours. As you become a little bit older and become a shop chief or a flight commander, I think you can even often make up for some of your flights imperfect work uh -huh. by redoing it or, you know, <laughs> yeah. whatever you need to, to make sure that the product you're elevating is the best that you can. Once you get to be a squadron commander, there is no way that you can understand or accomplish or check or evaluate all of those uh, tasks that your squadron is doing. There's just no way. Right. So I've told people before that taking command can feel like going out of control because like, where do you start? Right. There are all these things that we're required to do. So the kind of the book answer is that for me, you start with the design operation capability statement, right? The doc statement and kind of look at some of those essential tasks in there. All of that is often secret and kind of ambiguous and has a whole bunch more acronyms associated with it, right? Sure. But as an example, in a fighter squadron, you may have a list of missions that you're required to be able to perform. And on there, it would say like, you're required to be able to perform air interdiction. And from there, that's like some pretty broad guidance but you can have something that you can now go to other documents and train and evaluate your squadron too. Is that a good start to your question? Absolutely. Okay. So one thing I was going to mention is that uh, in one of your previous podcasts, you had talked about the commander's responsibility to promote and safeguard morale. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important that you think about executing the mission in terms of that. Okay. I know you guys had kind of gone off and talked about like some, some of the chili cookoffs and those things are nice, but I think the main point of it is that morale is highest when you're executing the mission and when your airmen are believing in that mission that they're executing. So if you ask an airman, you know, why they do their job and if they can explain their impact, then really, I think that that is the primary morale driver in a squadron. It can be cold and rainy and far from home and nobody's getting sleep, but if they know the mission matters, that morale is going to be high. That is a really interesting point, and I'm glad that's the direction that you wanted to go, because Reed and I, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the idea of mission first versus people always, and it's one of those cliche kind of cringy phrases that gets thrown around in the Air Force all the time, but here's a really great way that you can see where there's a balance between mission first and people always, is that if the people are taking care of the mission, then their morale can and should be high, which is then going to take care of the people well. Is that not so? Uh, that is true. And I think it's first important that, you know, you as a squadron commander, you get to define the mission, vision, and priorities of the squadron, right? Sure. So you take that doc statement, that design and operational capability, and then you're the one who gets to put the mission on the wall or put the mission on the slide or, you know, be the one to repeat that. And they're just words that a lot of people probably don't care about unless you care about them, unless you uh, kind of repeat them over and over. Mm -hmm. right. But you need to make that something that's short and simple and memorable. Like our wings mission here at Davis Mountain is rescue and attack. Basically two words. Yeah. And then if you can help every airman in the squadron tie their duties or their assigned tasks to that squadron mission, then you're going to have, you know, the higher morale and their understanding and like knowing the why behind it's going to really help them. And really that is the squadron commander and the squadron senior enlisted leaders responsibility is to make sure that every person in that squadron can tie their tasks back to the squadron's mission that you're overall responsible for. Specifically on the mission first people always question. I've always struggled with that phrase and maybe I'm going to get a call from the ACC commander's office here in a minute, but I've seen that on a million ACC slides I've always thought you can't do both. Okay. But when I've dug into that a little bit more, you know, you think you can't always put the mission first. You're going to burn out all the people and then there's no mission. Right. Right. You can't always put the people first or nobody's going to be doing the mission because everybody's going to be like doing what they want or spending time at home or in the gym. But I think I understand the intent and like really the rephrase of that is that the mission is the first priority, but always consider the people. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. I like that. So how do you actually balance it? I go back to the mission and vision priorities. And I think those are as much for the commander as something that they put on paper to hold themselves to and help themselves make a decision as they are for the rest of the squadron. But it really like grounds you in the squadron and the why you're doing what you do. And for me, the actual execution of balancing mission and people comes down to the priorities. A lot of that is like 
time and situation dependent. Yeah. As an example, in the Bulldogs in the 354th Fighter Squadron, our priorities are flying and family and fitness. So three simple words, flying is the mission, right? So we are going to develop, deploy, and deliver attack air power. And that is what we train to. And that is why this fighter squadron exists. So that goes back to like, are we training to the right things, to the right weapons and tactics? Are we evaluating the right weapons and tactics? And then family. So that's kind of like the, it's the first half of the people side, right? So both your blood and your squadron family, Mm -hmm. whether you stay on active duty for four years or 40 years, hopefully you're going to still have your family when you leave. Right. And the air force will be like, a slip of paper or, you know, a shadow box in the corner. So at the end of that, your family is still going to be what's most important. So the third is the fitness. So, you know, your physical, mental, intellectual, spiritual fitness that we need to think about and being able to like set those priorities is, is the commander's responsibility. And I think a lot of people do that. Well, the thing that I have tried to focus on is really not only listing out those priorities, but reminding everybody where we are in terms of those priorities. So if you're deployed, that mission's going to come first. Maybe you're at red flag or green flag, like that mission's going to come first. The expectation is you may have to work a 24 hour day at some point, just Mm -hmm. because that's what's required. Right. You may not get to call home tonight because you're working. I may have to ask a pilot to go, you know, take a go pill and fly a nine hour mission and eat a bunch of cliff bars and, sit in the same seat for 12 hours, which is not good for your health or your fitness, but that was what was required for the mission. And I think you have to realize that on the backside of that, there's some reconstitution that needs to happen. Right. And then there's times like, you know, we just had the holidays. So right around Christmas and new year's, like let's throttle back on the flying piece. Let's, let's let that mission take a back seat for a week or two. Now is really the time to go home and focus on your family, to go focus on your fitness, taking care of yourself catching up on sleep and really just like spending the quality time with family and friends. So not only listing those as the squadron commander, but defining where we are and maybe our training cycle right now and what is the most important priority and using those words, I think is important. Yeah, absolutely. You've outlined some really great principles. And I wonder if you can give us some examples where you've seen those things played out successfully or maybe leading to the failure because failure can be very instructive, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have some examples that you could share with us of either from your experience or from other commanders where you've seen success or failure in executing the mission? Yeah. So I think sometimes it comes down to giving incomplete or unclear guidance and intent Mm -hmm. is kind of how I look at it. Right. I'll tell you that often when I see something where I think we failed, a lot of times it's just, I wasted somebody's time. Yeah. Okay. Like, Hey, here's the direction I wanted to take you. And I now realize that you didn't go in the direction I intended, even though you were doing your best. And I think that was because it was not clear on what my expectation was. And that's something that I've really tried to focus on personally is how do I give the best intent that I can Mm -hmm. so that I am, you know, really prioritizing those, not going to talk managing resources in this one, but like people and money, right? So time and money are your most important resources there. So often my failure is given incomplete or unclear guidance and then and wasting airmen's time. So I try to avoid that as much as possible. Uh, one thing that I know our squadron right now is challenged with is the Air Force is moving towards, you know, agile combat employment. And that is the way fighter squadrons expect that they're going to operate. Uh-huh. And that is largely a logistical problem, right? It's largely a logistical problem that the fighter squadron is responsible for executing. And for us, knowing that that is how we're going to present forces in the future, but also knowing what our like essential tasks and our like missions are, trying to balance the focus there, right? So I have definitely taken us to exercises, set some targets, gone to the exercise, and guys come back and they're like, boss, tactically, that was not very <laughs> good training. <laughs> and a lot of that was kind of a waste in terms of the like tactics side, or we'll go other places and we'll get really good tactical training. And then we're like, yeah, we didn't really focus much on ACE and that's how we're going to present forces. So how realistic was it? Right. And so like, that is one of those things where the commander needs to zoom out and go, how can I optimize both of these things? And then be really, really willing to listen to the feedback, your flight commanders and your weapons officer and your DO. That's really important. Yeah. I can't agree more. I can't reemphasize that point enough 
that when you are in a position of leadership, obviously I've never been a commander, so I can't speak from that perspective specifically, but as an officer, you can't do everything. And that's kind of the point of this episode is that there's no possible way that the squadron commander or the DO or any one officer can do everything that is required by the squadron or the flight or you know, the mission order or whatever the thing is. And so you have to rely on other people and then close the feedback loop, get their feedback on what was good, what was bad, and how to do better the next time. Yeah, and there's kind of the formal and informal processes, right? So in a fighter squadron, we have a stand of L shop where I get the feedback on how's the training going, right? Right. But I will tell you that the absolute best times so far in my squadron command have been when one of my flight commanders walks in the door, closes it behind him and says, sir, I think we're doing this thing wrong. Right. <laughs> here's why I think we're doing it wrong. Here's the direction I think we should go. And here's why. Mm -hmm. And when they like give me that like well-reasoned dissent behind closed doors, and then, you know, sometimes I'm like, oh, you know what? I realized that this was my failure of, of explaining to you why we were going that direction. Uh, and there are other times they were like, I'm like, oh, I didn't realize that was the impression. Let's revector this and, and head in the right direction. Because it's really the commander's responsibility to like organize, train, and equip the squadron, right? To execute the mission. Right. And so in an ops squadron, I think you look at what are the deliberate training pieces that we're going to follow? And then how are we going to evaluate our readiness for that mission? So it's always best if you have a deployment on the books, right? Yeah. <laughs> Fighter squadrons are great because they usually get to go as the entire squadron together, uh -huh. which is really neat. And if you have that deployment scheduled, you have the perfect target, right? Learn that location, learn those targets, train to the weapons and the deliveries that will best kill those targets, learn the threats, and then those will drive the tactics that you're going to train to. And after you've trained to those weapons and those tactics, you can then go back and evaluate those weapons and tactics. And really, I think it's also the commander's responsibility to put the big training and readiness evaluation targets on the books. So again, for a fire squadron, it's like a red flag, green flag, combat hammer, jaded thunder, these bigger type of exercises that you're going to have a couple times a year. And then you give as clear a guidance as possible to your DO, your flight commanders, your weapons officer, your chief of Stanival, and say like, hey, here are the big exercises we're going to get ready for. Here's the deployment we're going to get ready for. I want you guys to now building block, train the squadron to get there and then evaluate them and see how we're doing along the way so that you know that when it's time to go, you are ready to go, or at least you know at what level of readiness your squadron is sitting. Of course, with no scheduled deployment, it's a lot tougher, but you're still very responsible for setting that direction. And I think that's when the exercises become even more important. Yeah. And bringing this back full circle to what you said earlier about the morale in executing the mission, when your people understand what it is that they're training for, it's that much easier for them to see the purpose in the training and be ready for the actual execution of the mission in the exercise or on the deployment and have their morale be even that much higher because you prepared them well along the way. Exactly. And really you need to kind of like repeat the why, right? So mm -hmm. unfortunately you see some wing exercises where it's like, oh, why do we want to do well on this? So we don't get downgraded. Right. <laughs> and that, no, that is not it. Like, yes, that may be a part of it. However, like, why do we want to do well on this exercise so that we are ready to go to war when it's time? Mm -hmm. Right. So we're about to go to a big green flag exercise in January. And the reason we are out there is because, and kind of the narrative I'm pushing is like, look, there is a kid, an 18 year old kid in his body armor with a rifle riding on a striker. Who's part of a striker brigade combat team out in the national training center. He's been sleeping under his truck for a couple of weeks. He's been eating MREs for a couple of weeks. He hasn't called home or seen his cell phone in a couple of weeks. And he's doing that because he's getting ready to go in a few months on deployment. Mm -hmm. And we are the ones who are going to like kill the targets, the artillery and the tanks that are threatening his life. Yeah. So yes, we want to take this objective, but like for us as a close air support squadron, we are going to go try to like protect the friendlies on the ground, which comes down to like the guy who could pretty much be, you know, your little brother that's out there on the ground. So right. I think that is super important to 
even in the training, even in the exercises, uh, reminding people why we're doing it. Yeah, that there is one of the most important things about being an officer, period, is that it's not about you. It's always about somebody else. For sure. Yeah. Sharing success, owning failure. If you haven't read that one, probably, probably a good read. Yeah. General Goldfein's book. Yep. Can't recommend that book enough. You need to understand both sides of the coin and be willing to own it. Absolutely. Yeah. And one other thing that I'll say as a squadron commander or really like any officer, any leader, it's important to lead from out front whenever possible. So oh, yeah. like as a fighter squadron commander in executing the mission, you can demonstrate that by leading the missions, leading the formations, by instructing, by evaluating. And then also like keeping the exact same standard as you do with everybody else. You come back after leading that flight. It never goes the way you want it. You always debrief it just the way you would for anybody else. You stand up in front of everybody and you share your failures there as well. And I know for other AFSCs, other Air Force specialty codes, it may not be as like clear cut as, you know, leading the formation or helping to plan the mission. But, you know, for security forces, that may be like standing at the gate every now and then. Right. That may be for, you know, I see our maintenance squadron commander here. I see him at night in the rain out walking the lawn. So I think the more people see you, you know, in it and working with them, the more motivated they will be and the more they will know you understand what they go through and the better you'll execute the mission overall. For sure. Leading by example, taking ownership of success and failure, caring about the people and their morale, providing that mission, vision, priorities, all of those things go into this package we call executing the mission, the commander's responsibility for it. Well, very good, sir. This has been great. Thank you, Plugger, for joining us on the episode today. If there's anybody out there who wants to get in touch with you, because they want to pick your brain a little bit more on what it's like being a squadron commander for a fighter squadron flying the A-10. Maybe they want to know about the agile combat employment or the ACE model. How should they reach out to you? How would you like them to get in touch with you? I'd say just find me on the global. There's three Gloyx out there. <laughs> okay. I'm the one whose first name is Gary, and I'm in the 354th Fighter Squadron. The other two are my wife and my little brother, so. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> You'll get to us if you send an email to a Gloyx. Okay. And if they can't get access to the global, they can just send an email to us at airforceofficerpodcast at gmail.com and we'll be happy to forward that on to you. Sounds great. All right, sir. So you've heard a number of our episodes. We usually end with the question about uh, what it means to be an officer. We're going to change that just a little bit for you since this is a series about command perspective. So final question to you, Plugger, what does it mean to be a commander? Let me think about that for a minute. For me, being a squadron commander is all about responsibility. So taking responsibility for all of the good and bad that goes on. And then outside of that, really setting the direction, the culture of the squadron, so that everybody is going the same way and understands the mission and understands the way that we're going to execute it as a team. I love it. Thanks, Plugger. I really enjoyed being able to hear your perspective, learn more about what it means to be a commander, be responsible for executing the mission. Is there anything else that you want to leave with the audience before we get out of here? I'll leave you with a couple of book recommendations since I know you guys are all about the professional reading list. Oh, yeah. For one, I'm going to agree with you on the mission, The Men and Me. Uh -huh. uh, that is one that should be a essential reading. And then Turn the Ship Around. Okay. So L. David Marquet is the author. He's a submarine captain. And to me, that is the kind of defines the mission command culture and the like leadership culture that you want. So the one big takeaway being he taught his team to stop asking for permission to do everything, taught them to say, I intend to execute this way. So you get people involved and people proactive in the mission and not thinking that they always need permission, but knowing that they are going to do what they think is best and then letting you know before they do it a lot of the time so that you can uh, just kind of revector them if you need. But those are two that I think everybody should read. All right. Very good. Lieutenant Colonel Fritz Gvojek, thank you so much for joining us. Plugger, it's been a pleasure. And thanks to you, audience, for tuning in today. That concludes this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.